Personal accountability. Though we may be affected by our parents' sins, each one of us is responsible and accountable to God for our own attitudes and actions. Here now is Gene Getz. When we look at this particular principle, we really have a principle that emerges from the whole biblical story. Because what happened when sin entered into the world? Well, one of the first things that happened is when God asked Adam a question, he said, well, it was the woman you gave me. When God turned to Eve, she said, the devil made me do it. It was Satan. And ever since then, I think we all have a temptation to blame somebody else or to believe that we are not responsible, somebody else is responsible. Now, this was a very serious situation there in Judah. Uh, among the people even that had come out through that second deportation, those 10,000 in that community. And obviously it was happening seriously back in Jerusalem uh, as these people were continuing to sin, which would eventuate in that final deportation where Jerusalem would be literally destroyed by God's judgment. Now the way in which we see this rationalization is that the people of Israel were using a metaphor or a riddle or accusing, perhaps I should say, Ezekiel of using riddles, not talking plainly. And so we read that, uh, a proverb. It's really a proverb. And so they say here, Ezekiel 18, 1 to 2, the word of the Lord came to me, what do you mean by using this proverb concerning the land of Israel? Now, here's the proverb, and you can see the rationalization, putting blame on somebody else. The fathers eat sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. In other words, it's the problem of our fathers. It's the problem of our forefathers. It's those who sinned in the wilderness. It's those who sinned in the land of Palestine. It's not us. We're not the problem. If we got a problem, it's because of our parents. And that's what he means by the children's teeth are set on edge by the sour grapes that the parents have eaten. Now, God was not pleased with that. And by the way, Jeremiah refers to the same principle, so it was being used early on before these people were taken into deportation. And so God responds. And basically, He says this, As I live, this is the declaration of the Lord God, you will no longer use this proverb in Israel. Look, every life belongs to me. The life of the Father is like the life of the Son. Both belong to me. The person who sins is the one who will die. In other words, what He's saying is, those who are living in Jerusalem those who are living in sin, who are disobeying, they will die, literally die physically. Now, certainly it applies spiritually, but he's talking about physical death. And he said, because of the judgment that is coming on you, you're going to be taken in death by Nebuchadnezzar, his armies, and others who are going to attack you. But you can't blame your parents for that. It's because of your own sins. And so God basically uh, deals with them. Now they come back and they say, well, God's not fair. That's not fair. Well, the Lord addresses that, God's fairness. Therefore, house of Israel, I will judge each one of you according to his ways. In other words, don't blame your parents. Blame yourself. This is the declaration of the Lord God. Repent. And here we have a beautiful, I believe, functional definition of repentance. What repentance really means. Repent and turn from all your transgressions. You see, repentance is really turning around, turning away from, to a new life. Repent and turn from all your transgressions so they will not be a stumbling block that causes your punishment. He goes on. Throw off all the transgressions you have committed. That's part of repentance. And get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why should you die, house of Israel? For I take no pleasure in anyone's death. 
This is the declaration of the Lord God. So repent and live. In other words, what he's saying is be transformed from the inside out. That's really true repentance. And here we have a, as I said, a functional definition of repentance here in the Old Testament that I think helps us to understand repentance as the word is used in the New Testament. Now, this raises um, a question. And that is, what about God's statement in Exodus 20? How do we reconcile what God said? Look at what He said. Do not make an idol for yourself. Now remember, they were at Mount Sinai. They had just come out of Egypt. Do not make an idol for yourself, whether in the shape of anything in the heavens above or on the earth below or in the waters under the earth. You must not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the father's sin to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing faithful love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. So if indeed uh, the children are responsible for their own actions, how do we reconcile God's visiting judgment to the third and fourth generation? Well, nowhere does God say that they can't change. Nowhere does he say, this is an excuse. Consequences of sin, we see that. It can be certainly uh, affecting children. And we see that happening even to the third and fourth generation. But God is not saying, you have to, uh, you, you, you are excused. In other words, change. Don't blame your parents. And that's what he's saying here in this particular passage. When you look at the total biblical story, in other words, he is not saying, God is not saying that we don't have a choice. We have a free will. We do not have to continue. We can break the cycle of sin in our lives. And remember, he said, they should have a new heart and new spirit. Now, eventually we know when the new covenant is really... Uh, activated in the life of the children of Israel, God's going to place in them a new heart, a new spirit. But for us as believers, and even for the children of Israel, they could have a renewed heart and a renewed spirit. This is prophetic, but it's also uh, in the present. And when we look at the story of Nicodemus, for example, I think we have a beautiful illustration that it can happen in the present. This applies to Israel, to an Israelite. It applies to Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews. It applies to us. And he came and he said uh, to Jesus, by night he said, we know your teacher come from God. No man could do the miracles you're doing except he come from God. And uh, Nicodemus uh, was puzzled by that. And Jesus really turned to him and startled him. And he said, Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you'll never see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus comes back because, again, he is, he's startled, and he simply says, well, how, how can that be? How, can I enter my mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus said, that's what I'm talking about. And here is the answer that uh, Jesus gave him. Jesus answered, I assure you, unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, my personal opinion here is that he's talking about physical birth with the word water, and he's talking about spiritual birth with the Holy Spirit. And you see that continuity because he says, whatever is born of the flesh is flesh. That's physical birth. And whatever is born of the Spirit is spirit. That's what I'm talking about, Nicodemus. Do not be amazed that I told you that you must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases. You hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. And as you read on in John chapter 3, eventually you come to John 3.16, and sometimes we don't realize that Jesus was talking to Nicodemus when he said, Nicodemus, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Nicodemus, you can be born again. 
And of course, with that statement, uh, God is saying that that's the message that He wants us to communicate to the world, that we can be born again. We can participate, and this is key, we can participate in the new covenant. Eventually, as I said, that new covenant will be fulfilled in Israel when God will put a new heart, a new spirit in them. He will be faithful to His promise that He made to Abraham. But in the meantime, until that happens, we are participating in that new covenant through the new birth. A wonderful, wonderful biblical truth. So here's the question for application. The children today are definitely impacted by their parents' sinful behavior. What steps can they take to stop the cycle of irresponsible behavior? And the first thought that comes to me is, number one, we need to be born again. We need to be born again. We need to have God's Spirit transform us from the inside out. And we need to forgive. Not only receive forgiveness, but we need to forgive others who may have sinned against us. We are to forgive as Christ forgave us. Lack of forgiveness can really set us back in terms of becoming what God wants us to become. In other words, there are those, including parents, who've sinned against us. And it's totally irresponsible. In some cases, it's totally evil. But if we don't forgive, we'll be in bondage, their bondage. And so forgiveness is really key. And then to internalize the Word of God. And this is all obviously part of the same process. It's not just sequential, but it's a process internalizing the Word, letting the Word shape us. As we read in Hebrews, the Word of God is, is quick, it's powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing asunder soul and spirit. The Word of God, letting it work in our lives. And then accountability. And God has established a wonderful means of accountability. Generally, the body of Christ. We're all accountable to each other, not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. But even within the larger family of God, we need accountability. It's really interesting. Think about Jesus. Jesus held the apostles accountable. But in a unique way, He held Peter, James, and John accountable. And in an even more unique way, He held Peter accountable. We all need accountability. We need special brothers and sisters in the Lord that can minister to us and help us to be accountable. So here's the principle. I call it personal accountability. Though we may be affected by our parents' sins, each one of us is responsible and accountable to God for our own attitudes and actions.